This is Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our web address is libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org. Today we are talking with Randy Simmons about his revised and updated edition, Beyond Politics, The Roots of Government Failure. Professor Simmons is a professor of economics and director of the Institute of Political Economy at Utah State University's John Huntsman School of Business. He is also the former mayor of Providence, Utah, and he is a senior fellow at the Independent Institute and the Property Environment Research Center. He is the author of The Political Economy of Culture and Norms, Informal Solutions to the Commons Problem. He is also a contributing author to many volumes, but one book in particular, Rethinking Green, Alternatives to Environmental Bureaucracy. Randy, we're glad to have you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask you at the, at the beginning, so your book is about public choice methodology and really bringing that uh, into dispute and controverting uh, welfare economics, which really provides a lot of the concepts and terms that help us think about the regulatory state or that, I should say, justify the regulatory state and the vast administrative bureaucracies that regulate um, and control pretty much everything we do. Uh, and you know, a lot of the terms that market failure, public goods, uh, imperfect competition, imperfect information, justifying regulation come from welfare economics. So sketch for us, wha- what is public choice and why should it be the baseline for our thinking about the workings of government? Um, I think it was George Stiegler who said that he, ch- he chided economists for uh, identifying all of the supposed failures of markets and then assuming that government could fix them. Uh, it, he said it was like listening to two contestants in a singing contest, and after hearing the first one, just awarding uh, awarding her the. Or, I, I actually, I think he said it. Listening to the two contestants, and after hearing the first one, she was so bad they just awarded the the, the prize to the second one without even hearing that one sing. Uh, the you know, humans are wonderfully imperfect. And our institutions are imperfect as well. Markets are, are that way, but our governments are even more imperfect. Uh, and when you st- as soon as you, st- the, what the welfare economists did was they established this framework for analyzing uh, how markets work. They compared uh, market outcomes to suppo- to what you would get if you had a perfectly functioning market inside of some mathematical model. And said, "Oh no, it doesn't work as perfectly as our models say that they should. That it should." And uh, but then they didn't even didn't apply their analysis to government, and so they just assumed government could fix problems without ever analyzing government. And what what public choice did was it looked took the same tools that welfare economists use for looking at at uh, markets and applied them to government, and we end up with re- realizing that government failure is a huge problem. And government failure just covers a host of issues, but it's where it's government failing to, to, produce, to uh, produce the outcomes that it could. And, in, and I think that we sh- show them beyond politics that uh, not only does government do less than pr- produce less outcomes that are, are not as good as it ought to, uh, but less the worse outcomes than it could if we actually restricted the scope of government so there's really an unfair comparison to begin with there's some platonic or insistence on platonic protection for the market but not for government what is the substantive vision of of welfare economics is it um, a a regulatory technical perfectionist aim is there uh, egalitarianism at heart is there a belief that you know the market itself is unjust or that it it's just too it's too messy. Things can't be predicted and controlled. We don't like that. I mean, what's what seems to be driving uh, this thing philosophically? Welfare economics just becomes a tool that can be used for uh, by people with lots of different ideologies. One is sort of the uh, just a positive look at markets and say, oh, they don't do a con- they aren't they aren't perfect. Uh, but the next step is to take the normative step, which is to say, um, well. Because they don't produce the equality that I would like in the world, we have to fix that. Uh, so you, 
most of the arguments that you actually see about promoting equality, I think, are, are based out of out of welfare economics, even when people don't realize that that's where their that their basis is. I, I was thinking, yeah, you mentioned government failure, uh, uh, of course, at the beginning, and you know, just kind of thinking though the public uh, reception, understanding of government failure. I mean, at at one level, there seems to be a broad you know belief that government is inept. Uh, that it's that it's certainly corrupt. There's a lot of corruption inside government, uh, particularly amongst politicians. There's, I mean, regulatory capture. That seems uh, people may not use that term, but they seem to kind of understand that. Um, and you know, even if you're thinking about current trends, I mean, there doesn't seem we don't see an overwhelming belief that the government's going to be able to you know efficiently administer Obamacare. At least I I don't sense that. Uh, but yet there's also contradictory impulses. I think. Um, in particular, you know, the, with Dodd Frank and the Consumer Financial Products Bureau, I think you know if you were to throw out what the CFPB is doing, uh, it's this monstrous bureaucracy created by Dodd Frank to regulate credit, essentially, and, and how banks and a lot of institutions, theoretically every institution, how they how they operate uh, and, and and interact with uh, uh, applying credit, et cetera. Uh, people say, oh, that, that's a good thing. That'll protect people. We like that. Or, you know, even thinking of the, the oil spill, the massive oil spill of British Petroleum several years ago in the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, there was no real discussion about, uh, you know, the, the problems and the incentives that led to BP to be drilling a mile deep way offshore. Uh, there was just kind of an assumption that uh, BP was bad and the government was needed to step in and and fix it. So I, I guess I'm, you know, it seems, you know, we laugh now about the idea of the best and the brightest, yet at one time people really believed uh, in that, that notion of, of, of smart people being in government fixing things. So, I mean, where do you, I just, I'm curious to get your reaction on that. Where do you, where do you sense people are and recognize this, this problem of government failure? You know, I spent uh, 10 years in local city government. You know, uh, I live in a town of uh, under 7,000 people. I was on the city council for six years and mayor for four years. And I was um, always amazed at how people would come saying, there's this problem in my life, in my neighborhood, fix it for us. Uh, this uh, sort of, there ought to be a law, a sort of knee-jerk reaction to things around them. Instead of, you know, <laughs> well, just for example, someone, you know, would come to me and say, my neighbor's dog is barking and it's bothering me. And uh, my first response was always, well, have you talked to your neighbor? Oh, no, I couldn't do that. He might get upset at me, but you can go do it for me. Uh, just something as simple as that, I think, illustrates why, it's so, why we so easily say, oh, the financial system had, had problems. Let's fix it by more regulation. Uh, it's just sort of this automatic let's you let's not take resp personal responsibility for stuff we're doing. Let's have government st uh, fix it. And as soon as you have a let's have government fix it uh, attitude, then it's easy to get to something like Dodd Frank, which um, you know. If I if I do a third edition of the book, there will have to be a financial institutions chapter. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, because my understanding of Dodd Frank is that Dodd Frank really helps the really big banks, uh, as you might have, as a public choice analyst would have predicted. It had very little to do with actually improving credit, but a whole bunch to do with uh, with restricting competition and uh, and, and protecting the the. the the position of those who are really good at lobbying. I was going to uh, talk with you briefly uh, about some other concepts and public choice and, and thinking about uh, current regulations, but I think we should also spend time and, and talk about uh, the great economist James Buchanan, who was a pioneer in this field and who, who passed away yesterday. And, and I know that uh, this is someone who's meant a lot to you, so I was just going to ask you to talk about him and, and his life and work uh, in this regard. Yeah, my undergraduate degree was in uh, political science, just a behavioral standard political science degree. I knew nothing about economics. I had taken one economics course and gotten a C in it. I thought it was terrible. I went to graduate school in political science, and the very first book I read was a, a book that had just come out by Jim Buchanan, a collection of his essays called Freedom and Constitutional Contract. And it was, uh, you know, you, you, you hear about a light coming on. Well, that's how it felt like. I, I suddenly could, saw the world through an entirely different lens than I had ever thought of before. 
And uh, Buchanan's book was, for me, the most important thing I read in graduate school. It was the most important uh, direction-giving set of essays that I had read, and it was... Um, you know, I didn't read the, the the more famous book, you know, the Calculus of Consent that he wrote with Tullock for years, but uh, I didn't read it until years later. But uh, he had a huge impact on my thinking about how the world worked. And what he he did along with uh, Gordon Tullock is they they started a research a, uh, agenda about how governments work and thinking about government as being able to look at government through the lens of economics. Uh, specifically, they were looking at issues of, uh, Buchanan's real interest was looking at issues of exchange, thinking of politics as a system of exchange, just as markets are a system of exchange. Uh, and that, But then you start seeing all of the issues that flow through government. He, he once was asked, I believe, uh, if public choice was a conservative agenda, and he said he didn't think it was. He thought it was just an agenda of looking at, at taking a non-romantic view of how government works. Uh, I, you know, thinking about my own career and that of many other people I know, there's probably nobody who had a bigger effect than Buchanan, and I think on, a, on an entire profession. He just, uh, he and Tullock took ideas that were floating around before they started to write together, and then as they wrote individually also, and uh, coalesced them into something that was a, a very wonderful, I think, uh, project. They initially, they first, they're, they're, uh, when they first started meeting with other people and who had similar agendas, they they put together a book of essays on the theory of non-market. Uh, well, he, he, he later said it was such a clumsy title that we had to figure out something else. Theory of non-market decision-making, I think yes, is what it yes, was. Yes, yes, I was trying to, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that is really clumsy, isn't it? Uh, and there was a group of them who met uh, uh, to read and talk about each other's papers and they came and it was out of that group that they came up with the uh the name public choice uh private choice economics is the study of private choices and public choice is the economic the, the uh, study of public choices and people who were around that table uh bill Riker, uh eleanor and vincent ostrom um uh buchanan and tulloch probably Bob Tollis and a few others, Bill Mitchell, who was my uh, mentor in graduate school and for much of the rest of my career, uh, he, he, he and I wrote the first edition of Beyond Politics together. Uh, I think Bill was the one who came up with the name Public Choice, but that, it was that, that small group of people who then sort of went out and populated academia in ways that... Uh, really changed the face, I think, of a, of a profession. Uh, pub political scientists looked at it as co sort of an economic imperialism, economists uh, <laughs> showing up in, in their territory, and it, they, it, many political scientists still object to it, but it, it really has, I think, permeated even political science, not just economics. It certainly, I, I think Buchanan's work, at least what I've read, and I don't really focus on is thinking about uh, I'll say constitutionalism uh, and constitutions and contracts. You know, he's, he's actually in many ways making explicit what was implicit in the political science of uh, certainly key uh, founders, uh, key framers of our constitutional order. And, and I think that's uh, tremendously, has been tremendously beneficial and to remind people you know, why we have this you know, compound government, you know, why we have federalism, separation of powers, why we they insisted on the rule of law, supermajority provisions. And all of that had been kind of forgotten in the Mau Mau of uh, democratic centralism uh, that's, that's really pervaded our government in the 20th century. Um, I, I want to move to perhaps another famous economist, um, uh, Vernon Smith. You lead off your book uh, with a Wall Street Journal article from some years ago in which they, they ask several Nobel uh, economists this question, uh, quote, in what sphere of life, if any, do you think it most important to limit the influence of market forces? And you know, they, they all respond with some version of, well, this, this, and this, and this, and it's quite substantive how 
the government needs to respond. But here's, here's, here's Vernon Smith's quote, uh, answer to this question. Uh, what sphere? None. Because markets are about recognizing that information is dispersed in all social systems and that the problem of society is to find, devise, and discover institutions that incentivize and enable people to make the right decisions without anyone having to tell them what to do. Uh, the idea that market forces should be limited stems from fundamental error. This is the wrong question. And I, I want to unpack that, particularly this idea of, of information uh, and localized information and knowledge, which is uh, certainly at the heart of what you do uh, as a public choice thinker, uh, along with other, we might even say it's a pillar, uh, I would think. Um, this information, localized knowledge, but in light of also a belief that with the digital revolution, we can handle a lot of information well. Uh, we can disperse it, we can uh, allocate it, analyze it, and apply it and make people's lives better. I mean, this seems to be part of actually Obamacare, in particular, one significant piece of that, uh, which is the Independent Payments Advisory Board, which has received a lot of attention because of, there seems to be really no check on what they do, at least from Congress. They, they're, they're an independent board uh, and, and can make decisions uh, about uh, procedures, the costs, what will be reimbursed, what will be offered to seniors. And this is actually going to hold healthcare costs down because they're going to aggregate knowledge all over the country. So are we, we where are we going wrong? Are, I mean, is, am I right? Are we just too confident about uh, information? Do we need to really think more about this problem that Vernon Smith was identifying? We're, well, we're back to the uh, socialist calculation debate of the 30s where the assumption was that uh, we, we, were, we could get good enough at managing information that we would know how to run uh, markets. And if we go back to that quote from Vernon, it's running people's lives. Because he says you want, you want systems where people do what they ought to do uh, without anybody telling them to. <laughs> um, and here, this is an assumption that we can gather enough information and then tell people what they must do. Uh, so it, it's, it really is back to that same debate that was, Hayek was having with the socialists uh, in the 30s. But um, I was reading yesterday in Tyler Cowen and Alex Tabarrok's tech, uh, macro textbook, which is now in its second edition, and they had a, a question at the end of the chapter about if you had a million people and there were a million things to know, and a uh, if you, you provide that information for all million people or you provide uh, a third of it to uh, um, well, you div divide that population into thirds and, uh, and provide, provide them different pieces, which would be the more, the, the more vital uh, uh -huh. system? And the idea that you take a million people and they know a million things, that may be great, but if you divide that information among lots of people, then what happens is that you get this sort of explosion of ideas and of information that, that comes because you have all these different minds working in different areas, not just the same area. And I think that's one of the problems with the Obamacare is that uh, the assumption that you can – that well – one of the problems is you, tr you try and centralize knowledge, you're going to reduce the knowledge that you have. Because, you know, even, even with our modern computer systems and, uh, and big data analysis, you have to decide what – somebody has to decide what information you drop along the way in order to come to conclusions. And uh, as soon as you start putting it into a computer program, then there are things that get systematically dropped. And we end up – but if you allow – individual people out there making their choices in a system where they can act, where they're actually responsible for their choices you're going to get uh, new information that will that none of us can actually anticipate in any way and that's the problem is that the assumption is that with Obamacare we can anticipate solutions uh, now I'm not saying that our health care system is works even close to perfect because it is such a, a mishmash system but even so, I think that if you allow uh, markets to work in that system, you'll have far more information, far better choices uh, than we will if we try and, and centralize. Because as soon as you centralize, even with big data, you're going to lose important information and 
draw and and simplify in ways that just don't reflect reality. It's interesting to think too. I mean, the, so the, you know, one basic problem of our healthcare system is uh, our pricing data is not exactly reflective of consumer choice. Uh, one reason why is is the third party payer problem. Uh, most, you know, not most. Uh, well, I, you know, I guess the majority of Americans still get their health care from their employer. Uh, and, and of course, there's this, you know, I'm not actually making decisions with my own money. Uh, health savings accounts are an attempt to, to get at that. But Obamacare does nothing about uh, uh, this problem. It seems to be an interesting comparison. I don't know. I was just thinking of Walmart and how many prices uh, they have to set every day. Uh, I mean, it's I mean, a, a huge number. Uh, but of course, what are they relying on to set their prices? What would health care under Obamacare rely on to set prices are, are too very very different things, as uh, uh, you could discuss. I wanted to think uh, also about I mean, this idea of, uh, of, of just trade-offs and people saying, I'm willing to trade uh, you know, economic growth or, or even, you know, think about all of these sectors, the financial sector, the healthcare sector, entrepreneurial vitality for some sort of stability, for some sort of uh, democratic baseline of, of services that, that would be offered if the government regulates it. How does... How does public choice respond to those sorts of claims? Um, with a huge amount of skepticism about the abilities of uh, government agents to actually accomplish what they set out to do, not because of waste, fraud, and abuse. We know that will be there, but it's not a waste, fraud, and abuse analysis. It's an analysis of incentives within institutions and uh, information flows within institutions. Uh, when as a bureaucrat, when I make a decision, uh, there aren't feedback systems that tell me if that was a good decision or a bad decision. At Walmart, they put a price on something, and the feedback mechanism is, do people buy it? And how many people buy it at that price? Or when they put something on the shelves, do people, or is it something that people actually buy, re even if it's a very low price? And, and you know, some things people just don't want. But if you're a bureaucrat, you don't need to know that. You just can s establish rules, and and you don't ever get the feedback to know if it's what if it's a good thing or how well it works necessarily. At least not the way that you do in markets. So it's a it's an information and incentive problem that uh, th that's what a public choice analysis would look at uh, with that. Uh, I'm thinking of. I mean, so obviously a, a huge part of, of what you've done with your research and other public choice scholars do is you really set forth a positive uh, empirical case uh, for government not being able to regulate well in a lot of areas. Uh, how does that inform or, uh, I guess, normative arguments or, you know, how, what, what, so, I mean, what are uh, ends and purposes of, uh, of government regulation or of, you know, things that we should place beyond politics? And also alternatively, I'll ask you, so what, what can politics do? I mean, what do we actually want the government doing? And, and, and how should we think about those, those, those sorts of questions? If you look at purposes American, the American founders thought about, those are the same purposes that I think we still have today. You, uh, you want a system of providing for the common defense. Um, you know, Buchanan was asked if he was a, an anarchist, and in, in the introduction to Freedom and Constitutional Contract, he said, um, in my, uh, philosophically, I'm an anarchist. Realistically, I'm a, a contractarian. <laughs> um, because my ideal world, I don't think, would last very long, the, the world of anarchy. Now, there's, there's some really cool uh, uh, anarchy theories that are around that, uh, but, that he just rejected uh, and said, Humans are too imperfect. We would, we couldn't live in the uh, Robert Nozickian world. We have to have some form of contract, and his form of contract is you provide for the common defense. Um, you provide a way for people to, uh, a, a ways to enforce contracts, a, a system of law and order, um, and not necessarily much beyond that. Uh, and... But but notice that you, you mentioned positive and normative. Anything beyond that becomes sort of normative position, saying, uh, I mean, there, there are many people argue that you have to have governments to provide a monetary system. The data don't show that that's necessarily correct. 
but that's a, that's a standard assumption. Uh, the uh, providing public goods and controlling negative externalities is generally viewed as a useful purpose of government. But uh, if we look at things like uh, at the environment and the understandings we've now gotten from free market environmentalism, uh, that argument doesn't push very far positively. It pushes a long ways normatively by people who, are, who believe that we need to be controlling other people's uses of the natural world around us. Actually, let me say the world around us, because who knows what natural means. Yeah, I, I was thinking of, uh, you, you talk a lot in the book, uh, in the section on law, about Ronald Coase's work. And I, you know, I think kind of this, you know, everyone understands, uh, I, I think there's a general belief, although I guess there's a lot of polling data that's disconcerting about, uh, you know, people preferring socialism or thinking socialism. Uh, I, they don't say work, but they think it's, you know, just, et cetera, uh, which is uh, it's really strange to me. But thinking about um, uh, this idea that there's just a lot of places that markets don't work, one of them being the environment. Uh, uh, other areas, healthcare is another we've been discussing, maybe even finance. And uh, I'll think about Coase's idea of property rights, which is, you know, we've, we've talked about prices, um, we've talked about information dispersal and, and needing to act on local knowledge. Uh, but this, there's this other thing out there of, of property rights and transaction costs that really you know, don't factor into people's common you know, way of thinking, but is you know, about government and its inefficiencies. But uh, Coase emphasizes it was a revolution in thinking. And I, but I'm also curious to know, I mean, how, how do you get around the transaction cost problem? Because that seems to be something that still looms large and uh, in favor of government regulation. The, the welfare economics argument is that um, there are these market failures uh, and one of the, one of the biggest market failures is externalities, the costs that I pr- that I create for others by my actions, and the, and the costs that I don't have to pay for, and that that is really standard uh, analysis. It's taught in every uh, undergraduate and graduate program, and Coase said that's just wrong. Uh, that any externality problem is a problem of property rights uh, should a be allowed to harm B or be allowed be allowed to harm a um, what are the property rights arrangements between them uh, one of my favorite examples from my time and as mayor was there was a uh, my, my city uh, is starts in the valley floor and, and then goes up to the uh, sort of the foot of of the mountains and, and as you approach the foot of the mountains it just gets higher uh and uh it's the area is called a it's a bench and the reason for that is because there was once this huge inland sea here and the, the benches are different levels of this the shoreline this is so in anyway, uh, northwestern utah uh-huh okay, okay. so uh this woman lived off the bench off of you know both levels of benches actually, and there was a proposed development up on up on the bench, and she was upset that traffic would be coming down past her street, and she said she always she always prefaced her comments in city council meeting with well you know I'm a PhD economist, and this is a perfect example of you impo- of you imposing a negative externality on me, and uh, I said to her so have you ever heard of Ronald Coase? He would suggest that externalities are two-way, that if you weren't there, there would be no externality, right? So do you actually own the road? Maybe you're the one causing the externality for the people who want, you, uh, who, who want to build a new home. She didn't like that. Of course, she hadn't voted for me, I know, so I wasn't losing a vote by... <laughs> <laughs> and every vote counts, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the idea that uh, it's unclear... W- uh, who truly has the right in that case? Because she didn't own the road, and if she owned the road, it would be there wouldn't be any externality because the, uh, the if people who wanted to use her road would have to pay her for it or couldn't or she could exclude them from it. Now then, the question is, how do you develop a, a road system that's entirely a private property system? Gordon Tullock once said he's never seen the libertarian case for uh, city roads, and, and he. He he may be right about that, 
but that that extra that does that gets back to your question about the transaction costs. How do you get negotiations between all of the people who want to build up on the bench and all the people who already live down in town uh, when they don't when when it's when you don't have clear property rights and uh, Kosa's point was it's the transaction costs that we we should be looking at and that if there is a role for government it's to be reducing the transaction costs the role for government is not necessarily to be controlling the externalities is to make it possible for people to actually negotiate the uh, solutions to their problems and uh, you know Terry Anderson at PERC the property environment research center argues that there are there are no externalities that externalities is as a as a word that just leads us in incorrect directions that what we have is because we have unclear property rights then what we have is this arena where entrepreneurs could try and find ways if government allows it could find ways of of allowing for the um to uh, actually create to, wealth to, to, yeah, yeah to so, to solve the problems to create new institutions for solving the problems like in the you know the case of uh say in Montana where you're you have these huge uh rangeland areas that are privately owned and elk come down in the winter and then go back up in the mountains in the summer and uh, it's how do we solve the problems there and the problems that have been uh, solved for uh, for so preserving that elk habitat is these uh, it's private institutions that have come in and created the, uh, these long standing easements essentially for elk and they've paid the, the ranchers to be able to have the elk there. It's just a, it's a very odd and interesting system that you would never have thought of if you'd just done a, a market analysis problem and say, oh, these ranchers are destroying elk habitat. Yeah, they own it, but they're not allowing the elk to come down there. Um, instead of recognizing there's a room for a political entrepreneur to come in and, and create new institutions. That's, I mean, that's a, a long-winded and not necessarily very clear answer to your question, but uh, if we allow, if you create an are, arena where people can, where somebody can figure out a way to bring the, the parties together in ways that none of us have ever thought of, then we can have solutions to problems. Um, it seems to me interesting, because I was, I, I've been thinking, and it seems to me it's you know, still in the early stages, but with the advent of health savings accounts, when, you know, the first you know, introduction of giving a lot of people uh, a lot of consumer choice in health care, you are seeing uh, hospitals. Uh, and ambulatory surgery centers and you know, doctors uh, put forward their pricing data on their website or yeah. contribute to clearinghouse websites where you can go get pricing data and see kind of the absurdity of this pricing problem. Um, it seems to me that, that, that continues to develop if we allow, uh, or if we were to move in that direction for healthcare, it won't uh, if, you know, if uh, you know, we really do institutionalize Obamacare and really you know, develop that legislation. Of course, there's so many other problems that will uh, make it difficult to implement uh, Obamacare. But also, as I was listening to you talk, so you know, something that goes on every few years are we up the CAFE standards, we up the uh, emissions requirements for automobile makers, and, and less and less emissions, uh, and there are all sorts of problems that are created by that. Although, you know what, it does make the air cleaner. I mean, that is... That is one thing. So, but how? I mean, think about the transaction costs there, and and so what you are you in applying what you are saying? Uh, we should actually incentivize companies to reduce emission standards in other ways besides just uh, a tax or a, a command control regulation. So, I mean, I guess I'm just how, how how would you handle that, or how do you think would be a good way to handle that? Well, cafe standards are a really inefficient way of reducing air pollution. Uh, for one thing, they you're telling somebody in North Dakota that their car has to be have the, the same standards as a car in Southern California, where there are so one place you have you you don't have enough population to cause any problems at all, and the other place you, you have lots of people with their automobiles producing uh, stuff out of their <laughs> producing emissions that then coalesce with other emissions, and you get all the chemical reactions, and you end up with uh, with, with smog problems. Uh, and so just increasing emission standards don't do anything about people's driving habits. It doesn't affect uh, 
it, 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 it's a very, very costly way to achieve sort of small increments in, in improvements. The, uh, a much more efficient way than that is simply, uh, I've I just been writing about carbon taxes, and I'm uh, in general very suspicious of them. But a much more efficient system is, would be is a, a, a tax on on gasoline, and you would compl- you would get far better improvements. You would actually get demand for vehicles that have higher mileage standards if gasoline were more expensive, and it it would be far less expensive to the economy to to people individually to have a system like that where it actually affected individual choices than a system that. Of, of regulation. Re- regulations are, they don't affect choices in the way that prices do. And so it, it's possible to make arguments that if you, know, if you have externalities where people just cannot come together in any meaningful way, that a much better, that a, a role for government is to figure out a way to, to get prices more closely to where they would be where they ought to be to, to solve the problem. And uh, uh, so I, you know, I hate to be arguing for uh, taxes, but this is one case where a, a tax would be far, far better than the system that we have adopted. Yeah, I mean, I think, right, as we one goal uh, is efficiency and, and uh, you know, allowing wealth to, to grow, allowing people to create wealth in the products and services they provide. So, yeah, I, I, I understand your point. I want to, uh, maybe we can end uh, on, on a hopeful note, uh, and, and I just wanted to get your thoughts. So, um, uh, promising reforms, and of course, this is such a vast area. I mean, so many different parts of our lives are regulated uh, and, and come under you know, what we call the regulatory state. Uh, but I was just thinking through, uh, so there's two things pending right now. One is uh, uh, enforcing a cost-benefit analysis on courts. Um, uh, some people are writing about this, uh, uh, that the federal courts would actually have to apply a cost-benefit analysis test uh, against bureaucracies when they um, uh, uh, propose rules. So that, would, that would be something that in, in a court's toolkit. And then also requiring rules that have a significant cost to the economy to actually be passed uh, by both the House and the Senate. Um, and also, I was just going to ask you, I mean, uh, three books, or maybe you know, one or two or three, I don't know, uh, that really help us understand the problems we've been discussing today. If, if you could leave us with some recommendations, I think that'd be good. Ask me that again. Are you saying three, did you say three books? Well, I don't, I don't know. I was just thinking of some ways, some things that uh, help people get a handle on thinking about the regulatory state. Uh, I didn't know if there's anything you had read recently that, that, that you could recommend. Uh, so I was just I was just curious. Michael Grieva has a, a recent book about yes, that. Yes, yes, he's he's one of the bloggers at Law and Liberty, uh, the Upside yeah. Down Constitution. Yeah, applying Jim 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 Buchanan's uh, work uh, yeah. to thinking about the Constitution. Yeah, it's wonderful. His, his work is some of the best around, I think, on that and that topic. Uh, if you're you know looking for a completely satirical view, but actually has really deep insights, uh, anything that P.J. O'Rourke has written. Uh, <laughs> Is uh, I, I, you know, for students to read P.J. O'Rourke, oh, yes. you know, e- even you know something as old as the Parliament of Horrors, yeah. is a good way of stepping back and saying, oh, let's think more seriously about how things get organized. Looking at welfare, for example, um, uh, what else that's recent? Uh, you know, Terry Anderson and Don Leo have just. Uh, they have the newest ed- edition of uh, of free market environmentalism, which I think is a really hopeful view of how we might have environmental uh, protection and but have it done. And uh, you know, going back to the Vernon Smith quote about where you have institutions that actually encourage people to do the right thing as opposed to try and tell them yeah. what the right thing is. So th- that's those are a couple I think quite good examples. Okay, so um, and, and just thinking going forward, what are what are promising uh, reform ideas or efforts that you see out there uh, for dealing well, with? Well, any effort to try and get courts to actually have to recognize the cost of their decisions, yes. I think, is a is a really important thing. You know, for example, in the Endangered Species Act, the uh, the legislation specifically prohibits the court from considering economic. Consi- uh, uh, 
a- any economic considerations. Okay. You're only looking at the particular species. So uh, if in order to... So that's why we get these absurd situations of the snail darter and, you know, millions of acres being, you know, uh, no, can no longer be farmed or made productive, et cetera. Yeah, you look at uh, uh, southern Utah, for example, you have uh, the Utah prairie dog that's protected and... Uh, they they have whole cemeteries and golf courses that can't be used because you've got prairie dogs in them, okay. uh, yeah. and it's and, but the and, but the, we could spend a long time talking about that. Yeah. But you know the court cannot look at economic considerations for that. So if courts were required to consider look at economic considerations, of course you get lots of competing arguments about them. But at least you could have the arguments. Yes, and to, I. I really am in favor of legislative bodies having to approve uh, regulatory decisions. You know, the, just because once the, uh, the legi- once the legislative body says, "Let's here's the law. Let's create this new law that does X." Well, it can't do X until unless you have a whole bunch of regulations that make that put X into place, and it's the design of those regulations that really are going to co- create costs. And so I, I would think if you sent back to those legislators the results of their legislation, first of all, you would have a better analysis of the, of the effects. Uh, secondly, you might actually get legislators to recognize the costs that they do create for people, often unintentionally. Yeah, no, that I, I keep thinking about. So, what what are the types of arguments you could see? You know, getting into the battle of of dollars and how you weigh uh, an economic regulation. Uh, seems to be that's even to bring that conversation forward and make it public and make it part of deliberation. The way we think about uh, the regulatory state uh, would be a positive thing. Uh, I, I would think. Um, I, I was just. Um, uh, uh, I guess we we can end. I um, uh, will mention the book is Beyond Politics. The Roots of Government Failure. Randy, I've really enjoyed talking with you about your work and uh, public choice uh, theory and understanding more uh, about how to, uh, how to think about uh, this problem of the regulatory state. Thank you. Well, thank you. This is your host, Richard Reinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, and find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org.